Uh, with the speed of light, I would like to um, address the issue of the Katyn Forest Massacre in the context of the um, several types of genocidal practices directed at the Polish National Group um, by the leadership of the Soviet Union between 39 and 41. We must remember that for 40 years we understood Katyn uh, as a Katyn, massacre, uh, Katyn Forest Massacre, that particular one location with those uh, mass graves of uh, 4,400 uh, bodies. That was in our um, imagination the meaning of the word Katyn. Today we know that this is uh, only a drop in a bucket, that this is only one of many locations and some of them are discovered today and some are not. So um, we know from, uh, from the uh, March 5, um, 1940 execution order, we know that the Soviet Politburo uh, sentenced to death uh, 25,700 uh, Polish prisoners of war and Polish civilians arrested on the uh, conquered Polish territory. They, the, 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 the number they, the, they wanted to kill was 25,700. We know from the report from, um, from the internal uh, Soviet Union report from 59, when they decided to destroy all the files of those people murdered, uh, that um, this uh, report uh, indicates that they managed to kill 21,857 um, um, citizens of Poland uh, pursuant to March 5th execution order. Um, now, um, obviously the most famous location with those uh, victims is in the Katyn Forest, discovered in 43, and um, the uh, investigation, the International Red Cross investigation confirmed um, that um, over 4,400 uh, bodies of the Polish officers were found in the, those grace, graves. Out of this number, about 2,800 were identified positively by the Polish Red Cross on the scene in uh, 1943. Um, and also the, the subsequent uh, Russian report, the so-called Burdenko report, uh, never questioned the fact that those were the Polish officers, never questioned the identity of the victims, only the timing of the crime. Um, the um, other locations were discovered basically uh, after 1990s, after the time when the, um, 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 Gorbachev first and then Yeltsin uh, subsequently delivered the March 5th execution order to the Polish side in 1992. And that is when basically during that time two other um, ma sites of um, mass graves were discovered and identified. Today we know that the pro Polish prisoners of war from Starobielsk camp were murdered in Kharkov and uh, buried in the Piatihatki uh, forest. And that's where um, the father of uh, Mr. Adamczyk was buried. Um, we know uh, that this, those graves were subsequently uh, demolished and uh, there was a clear effort to um, destroy the evidence of the crime in this, in this uh, particular site. The uh, other special camp with the Polish prisoners of war was lo located in Ostaszku camp and that was the largest camp, over 6,000 uh, prisoners of war, primarily policemen and uh, um, gendarm gendarmerie, I guess, <laughs> uh, policemen primarily. And this is a, also, again, the, um, the bodies of the, pri uh, the prisoners from Ostaszków were taken to Kalin and Tver, Tver NKVD dungeons, let's put it this way, to the NKVD headquarters in Kalinin, and they were murdered there and buried in Med Miednoje. Uh, what's very interesting is that when the Soviet Union began the investigation, their own investigation into the Katyn crime in 1991, uh, there was an opportunity to interview um, Mr. Tokariev, who was the chief of NKVD at Kalinin during those executions. And uh, I, I think it's worthwhile to, uh, quote, to, to give a quote from his testimony, but, uh, because 
uh, it carries certain weight. We went, and uh, first of all, he, he testified that Stalin sent his top executioner from Moscow to Kalinin, uh, Mr. Uh, Vasil Blochin, uh, specifically for the purposes of preparing, planning, and implementing the execution of the Ostashkov prisoners. So uh, Blochin with his team came to Kalinin, and with the help of Tokariev, they planned this whole process of exterminating over 6,000 Polish prisoners of war. And uh, Tokariev in 1991 recalls the moment when they were ready to go. We went, and that is when I noticed all this horror. Blochin put on his special clothing, brown leather cap, long leather protective garment, brown leather gloves with cuffs above elbow. It made a tremendous impact on me. I saw the executioner. And Blochin team worked very efficiently and with great speed, extinguishing one life every two minutes. And Tokariev, um, and I read some commentaries that it, he even said that with a certain prize, pride, that it was a truly industrial undertaking. Now, those three prisoners of war camps, uh, Kozielk, Starobiesk, and Ostashkov, they pertain to the prisoners of war, people captured on the battlefield during the invasion of Poland. But the other group of those condemned by the March 5th execution order were over 7,000 people arrested on the Polish territory incorporated to the Soviet Union. So in other words, Eastern Poland taken over by the Soviet Union, the, the NKVD, death squads were, according to the prescription list of the uh, well-committed uh, communists on the ground, to certain analogy with the German minority in Poland, they were preparing prescription lists for the execution of the Polish elite. The same was done on the, on the Soviet side of, the Poli of, of, the, of incorporated territories. And according to those lists, the, the arrests were made. Uh, and um, uh, simultaneously with preparing the um, extermination of the prisoners of war from those camps, uh, Beria sent orders to the local prisons in Belarusia and Ukraine to congregate all those prisoners in uh, several locations. From Belarusia, everybody was shipped to Minsk, and from Ukraine, they were shipped, the prisoners in the prisons uh, in Ukraine were shipped uh, to... Um, uh, to two other three locations, including Kiev, Kharkov, and Kherson. They were murdered there, and frankly, we have the least information about those victims. We know today that uh, very recently, this is, this is still an untold story. We are still in the process of researching this. But at least we know today that most of those civilians killed pursuant to this March 5th execution order were buried in Kuropaty mass graves in Ukraine and in Bykovnia in mass graves uh, cemetery in Belarusia. Altogether, according to the internal Russian documentation, uh, Soviet documentation, uh, 7,300 7, uh, and some. Okay, now, uh, so we have the killings of the prisoners of war, the killings of the civilians, and at the same time, uh, the um, um, Politburo, the top leadership, Beria, Stalin, um, and uh, Mawotov to some extent was, but primarily Beria was planning, uh, the deportation of the families of the condemned men uh, to, uh, from Eastern Poland to forcibly remove the families of those condemned men from the conquered Polish lands. Uh, so bef bet between March, March 5th and April the 5th, when they started those executions, they were collecting the list of their family members to make sure that they, those people can be removed from their homes and sent into oblivion. Uh, they, they, they started March 2nd with the first order for deportations. March 7th, uh, they, uh, they sent requests to compile a list for family members. And the March 20th uh, order is interesting because um, it says that uh, those family members must be deported to Siberia. Please show me the time when I... Um, uh, they, they must be uh, sent to Siberia, and they are saying, Beria is saying in this order, that we plan to deport 25,000 families. That's interesting because we are killing 25,700 people. 
by March 5th order. So the logic is, okay, we, we killed 25,000, so now we deport 25,000 families. And he even is precise enough to estimate that each family is between three and five members because he uh, indicates that those deportations of the family members will be between 75,000 and 100. Thousand people. From our experience uh, as a Cresce Siberia group a member, we are re recording testimonies of the people deported, and we know that average size of the family deported to Siberia was between five and seven people. So the estimate of uh, three to five is very low on a very low side. Okay, so those are deportations which are in inherent component of the killings. Those are the two sides, two types of genocide, uh, genocidal action directed at the Polish people at the same time. As, uh, this is critically important because when, we, when we, in our notion, the, we, we think about Katyn's killings. No, this is much more than killings. This is uh, um, killings, deportations, and really uh, genocidal uh, practices uh, geared towards exterminating the Polish national group on the Polish territory incorporated to the Soviet Union. And to prove that very quickly, um, this is the, a card, a postcard sent from Starobielsk uh, to, by Mr. Herzog, a, a prisoner of war from Starobielsk. He's writing to his family in Lubaczów near Lwów. And he's saying in this postcard that I will be transferred to another location and uh, you will not hear from me for a long time. What's interesting is this card was written on April the 6th, just a day before he was shipped to his death. And the uh, correspondence of the prisoners of war was stopped in the middle of March. So this card supposed not to go anywhere. But there was a guy, a Polish guy at Starobiersk, an employee, who actually crossed out the, the uh, hometown address of his family. And he himself, in his own hand, wrote on this postcard their new address on the deportation location in Kazakhstan. So this card, instead of going to Lubachev, went directly to Kazakhstan to some kind of a settlement in the middle of a desert where his family with his father, mother, wife, and, uh, and three children were deported on April the 13th. Okay, so that card went straight to Kazakhstan, meaning that those people in, in Starobielsk, they had the deportation lists in front of them, which shows how integral, uh, how um, uh, closely related those two actions are. This is the card that he wrote. Um, now, if, if you think this is bad, <laughs> this is a piece of cake, because this was already a second mass deportation. The first mass deportation took place on February the 10th. Uh, and this was a huge, massive deportation prepared by the Soviet Politburo and by the Beria. The uh, directives and orders for the first mass deportation from the Polish territories went out in December, starting December 5th, with precise instructions how to deport, whom to deport, and, uh, and where to deport uh, between December 5th and December 30th. Very precise operation, very impressive, by the way. And who was subjected to it? Uh, um, local authorities, mayors and uh, council, local city council people, the military families all, all together, men, everybody, and uh, railroad workers and forestry workers, all together a couple hundred uh, uh, people, a couple hundred thousand people, and the numbers are still not being uh, determined. Huge numbers. This was the, the critically important deportation because if you imagine to expel in the middle of the night the family of five, just take them from their beds and put them on the sled, then put them on the train to Siberia in the middle of no, uh, February 1940. The highest uh, re death rate in this deportation. Horrible. Next. Then 
we have two more waves of deportations. They don't stop. They, they, we have the February, the first one, then the families of the condemned men. Then we have June deportation when they deport those people, mostly those who were trying to escape the Nazi oppression in Western Poland, so-called refugees. And that group included many Polish citizens of the Jewish origin, predominantly Polish citizens of the Jewish origin, again in hundreds of thousands. And they also went to Siberia, but luckily in June, okay? Then we still have one more deportation. Oh, I'm sorry, I went back too far. But there is one deportation that, you know, it makes you even laugh because this is the deportation of June 20th, 1941. And this is the deportation focusing on the Polish intelligentsia and those who escaped previous deportations. And if you think about it, those deportation trains were leaving Western Poland towards Siberia and Kazakhstan at the time with the, when the Nazi Luftwaffe was entering the Russian sphere of influence when the, when the Nazi Germany army was crossing into the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, instead of thinking how to defend themselves against the na Nazi invasion, they were preoccupied with persecuting the Poles and sending them uh, to the oblivion. That's for waves of the deportations. And the point is what's important to know is that because we can evaluate um, how big those deportations were. Um, and um, what's important is that there is the, um, they were stopped because probably they would have many more waves of deportation but for the German invasion. What's important is the Russia, uh, American intelligence report from 1943 prepared in London compared the deportation list and the categories of deportees with the categories of deportees from the Lithuanian order because th th those documents were available. And in that report, uh, the conclusion is made that the Polish deportation orders had much broader categories of people to be deported than the Lithuanian orders. So in Lithuania, out of three million people, they, a prescription list for deportation included 700,000. And that was on a limited scope of the categories for deportation. The, the deportation list for, uh, lists for Poland, because they were much broader, they would impact much larger percentage of the uh, population in the uh, conquered Polish territory. Um, now, those are the uh, picture of those Polish people sent to Siberia, beautiful Polish ladies in the taiga or in, in, in Siberia, the family of children and women primarily. And then below you have a group of Polish orphans, a massive, massive um, production of orphans, if you will. Uh, what happens then, we have a sikorsky maisky agreement, uh, Nazi uh, invade, and suddenly the Russians need the manpower, so they become friends with the Poles. And in the sikorsky maisky agreement, summer of 41, they say, we declare the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact null and void. So we uh, basically uh, withdraw our claims to Eastern Poland that we, the, 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 the Polish areas that we are talking about and the Polish areas that we incorporated to the Soviet Union. They declare that in this pact. So great, you know, Eastern Poland is back, right? Uh, of course not. Uh, in, that, in that pact, they also, they also declare amnesty for all Polish people in the detention centers in, 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 in the Soviet Union. Everybody, every, we have some of, of the uh, chil uh, Sibiraki children. They always ask, amnesty for what? What did we do that we had to have an amnesty? And the answer is, well, amnesty for being Polish. Now you can be Polish and still alive. That's really, now bl briefly, I'm still, uh, I will be jumping through. Uh, so, as a result, uh, there is a formation of the Polish army in the Soviet Union from those people deported. But it, of course, once Stalin resisted the initial attack of the German army, he becomes bolder and bolder and, uh, and disregards the uh, sikorsky maisky Pact because he feels strong. Now he feels he can resist, he can stand up to the Germans. So now he can squeeze the Poles again. In that very moment, in that window of time between 
uh, March of 42 and October of 42, General Anders, if, if, with the help of the British, is able to open the doors of those Polish detainees, refugees, amnesty, or those people persecuted in Russia to go with him to, to, to evacuate the, the Polish um, army together with the Polish families, families of their soldiers, meaning all the Polish civilians, as many as he could, he evacuated to Iran through, through um, Krasnovodsk to Pahlevi, and he managed to evacuate 120,000 people. Out of it, 50,000 went with, to, to form the second Polish Corps and uh, won the Battle of Monte Cassino. Those Sibiraki won the Battle of Monte Cassino and opened the passage to Rome for the Allied forces. Those Sibiraki from those gulags. And the family of 70,000 civilians, that is a horrible chapter of the history that we as a humanity didn't even start scratching. I will just run through the pictures. Those are the Polish children in Tehran when they arrived to freedom. Uh, majority of them didn't make it. And uh, I will show you this lady. Uh, she lost her grandmother first in Siberia. She lost her mother on her way to freedom, still in Russia. He lo she lost her father two months after reaching uh, Iran, uh, Persia. And then she lost her little brother on October, the six-year-old brother on October two, uh, 1942. And um, she never knew where her brother was buried. This is the picture that she got. This is the picture of the Polish cemetery in uh, Tehran, in Durab. She got this picture a year ago, and she said this is the most precious possession, the most precious things in her, thing in her life. The first time she was able to see the place where her little brother was buried, and that is 45,000. Polish citizens buried in that cemetery, and this is not all. Those are all the places when the Polish refugees were spread throughout the world, through, like you see, Lebanon, Palestine, India, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rhodesia, South Africa, New Zealand, Mexico. A major, massive, climatic, climatic impact on the entire international community. Many of them, this is an orphanage of the Polish uh, Polish orphans in India. Many people were left behind. Only 120 made it. But it is estimated that 300, 350 to 500 were left behind and were lost forever. My presentation does not include, does not even touch on the context of persecution before and after, on the international lie, on the complicity of the international community in this crime, on the geographical impact just briefly illustrated, and on the generational impact. This crime reverberates in the fourth generations and many generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, um, Professors Barrett and Ledford. Um, we do have about 15 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, I can take the questions, and if you can uh, state your name, and then please tell us which panelists you are directing the question to. Yes, I'm George Backlar. I represent the Committee in Support of Solidarity. Just one second. If you can just wait for the microphone. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, my question is directed at uh, Dr. Uh, Ledford. I appreciated his remarks. I thought he was very succinct and uh, precise. My question, however, is you referred to the gover Polish government, and you didn't say government in exile. And I also wanted to, I, I'm not saying this is a criticism, but I'm suggesting to you that people don't realize at this same historic period of what was going on in Poland, and of course we have the benefit of hindsight because we know what happened was uh, the, the the Lublin government being formed in its infancy uh, which then led to Stalin's imposing the Lublin government on the Polish people following uh, the end of the war but my point was people need to understand the distinction 
between the Polish government and the Polish government in exile led by Mikołajczyk following the tragic airplane crash in Gibraltar, July 1943, of Sikorsky, right. who had been in one of, your, one of the pictures here shows Sikorsky with Anders in, in Moscow with Stalin with the list of the officers in December of 1941. So that was my only comment. I thought your remarks were very succinct, but that one little inaccuracy, uh, or not inaccuracy, oversight, it's the same one I have with uh, people who refer to Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia as the Baltic states when they're really republics. They're not, they're not like West Virginia or Maryland or uh, those Hi. places. Thank you. Well, I mean, it, it's actually a little more complex than that. And I, in interest of time, I excised a reference to the efforts that the Polish government made uh, uh, from really 1940, when the letters stopped, uh, until um, uh, uh, 1943 to clarify the question of where these officers were. The, the Polish government never gave it up. You have the, the Western government, you have the Moscow, then the Lublin government, and then you have local Polish administrators in the general government who are trying to make the lives under terrible conditions of German oppression as, as easy as possible for their fellow Polish citizens, to whom the Germans then turn when they need a Polish delegation. Uh, and, and those local administrators who are always facing the accusation of being collaborators with the occupiers uh, it's like the councils in the Jewish ghettos. Uh, it's a terrible dilemma that these people still on the ground in the general government face. So, so there are even more actors uh, representing Poland uh, than you suggest. The government, following the September campaign, they wound up in France. These were the legitimate... Oh, sure. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not denying... I'm not denying that at all. London following the debacle of Dunkirk. And that's what I'm referring to when I say the government in exile because the Moscow-Lublin one is entirely a creature of the Soviets. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, I have a microphone. Oh. Hi, I'm John Kurowski. I'm a practicing lawyer and I uh, teach as a visiting professor at Copernicus University in Poland. Uh, professor Barrett, thank you for your presentation. I thank enjoyed you. the historical context of Justice Jackson. My, my question was Justice Jackson as you've told us uh, in his thoughtful testimony said nothing prevents this from going forward um, and he got an interesting commentary from his colleague in Britain but is there any evidence in your research that and this is 1952 that anyone followed up uh, after that or was any discussion about well maybe we should do something about this because by then we didn't like the Russians very much and they didn't like us and and I think we know the answer, but if not, what were the legal and political, uh, what was the legal and political obstacles or climate then that prevented uh, that from happening? Um, the answer is no, as, as you suspect. And it's interesting, the Madden Committee issues a, a, an interim report in 1951, which has an interesting little conclusion tucked in it, calling for an international tribunal like Nuremberg to prosecute the perpetrators of Katyn. By the time of the December 1952 final report, and Jackson and Kempner and Stammer have all testified in the interim in early 52, um, that has dropped out. And I think that's just a measure of Cold War realism. Um, you know, accidentally, because of uh, the Soviet abstention, the United Nations could authorize a response to the North Korean incursion. But the idea that there was an international organization, and we only had the UN, we didn't have an international criminal court, we didn't have states parties, any, you know, any architecture for it. There was no institution to sort of pick up this vague idea, which was there in 1951, and still there as an open possibility in Jackson's testimony, but not something the Madden Committee is grabbing by the end of 52. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, um, Dr. Anna Spinder, I'm a medical doctor, but from Chicago. I have a question for Professor Barrett. You did mention that um, the Polish government in exile was sort of passive during the Nuremberg trial. Is that right? 
I mean, yeah. could it have been because there were uh, maybe some double agents in that uh, government? Oh, it's, it's very complicated. There are uh, Poles in London who are part of the United Nations War Crimes Commission, which was a, an intra-war fact-gathering body, um, who are counterparts alongside the London Conference and trying to participate. There are then other Poles uh, who are on the ground in Nuremberg. It's very unclear what their independence is or their connection to the Soviets. Um, they're not part of the principal four at the tables on the bench or at the prosecution. They're among the 20 subscribing nations that are consultants and diplomatic allies and spectators. Uh, and it may well be that sort of sense of we don't know who we're dealing with. And the other question is for um, Maria Schoner. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, the figures regarding the number of victims um, are sort of controversial as far as Poles who, who were sent to Siberia. And a lot of individuals argue as to what the precise number is. Of course, we'll never know what the precise number is. But what is the latest estimate as to the number of individuals that were exiled? I know of two million. <coughs> Are there any other numbers? And if you could just uh, yes, it. absolutely. Um, it has been it has been for many years believed that the number, according to the estimates of the Polish government in London, uh, based on the reports from from the those uh, people exiled and based on the reports from the Red Cross, it was estimated between a one and a half and one and a eight million. Uh, however, the documents that were released, uh, declassified uh, by the Russian Federation in the 1990s, based on those documents, uh, Dr. Guryanov was involved in uh, uh, preparing reports of that, of those uh, deportation lists on the receiving end. And uh, those numbers come to get close to 320,000. Uh, of course, there are many questions about this total number that is presented in the documents released. The first issue is that those uh, lists were compiled at the receiving end of the deportation journey. And as we know from the first deportation, the death rate during this six weeks transition to the oblivion was at least 10%. Um, but uh, we would never know exactly. Uh, this, this, uh, there is a second problem, and that is fundamental problem, that uh, the Russian Federation is uh, um, 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 conducting a selective uh, declassification of documents and only the, the documents that they they wish they declassify so absolutely we there is no reason to believe that those are the complete lists and also the another issue is that um, based on those people who escaped uh, to, to Persia and those who returned to Poland after the war, based on the data, including also the, the, those Polish people who were uh, forcibly forced to serve in the Red Army, okay, those numbers show a m much, much higher uh, number of persecuted Poles. So this question is, uh, in my opinion, still open to debate. Thank you, Maria. Unfortunately, I have been informed that we do not do not have any more time for questions. So please uh, join me in a round of applause for our speakers. Okay, we have um, a pre-lunch speaker. So uh, 15 more minutes, and then uh, you'll be able to go off. Um, you've heard today how the US Congress played a key role in exposing the truth about Katyn in 1950. And Congressman Kucinich this morning expressed his willingness to get Congress to re-engage in the issue and challenged us to provide the ammunition that he would need to do so. Well, we are doubly blessed to have with us this afternoon, or just before the afternoon, um, Congresswoman Mary Kaptur uh, of the U.S. House of Representatives, who will be addressing us for the next 15 minutes. Um, relevant to the 
topic of today's conference, Congresswoman Kaptur is of Polish heritage. She was the first member of her family to attend college, but she ended up attaining a PhD in urban planning and development from MIT. She was elected to Congress in 1982, and she has risen in seniority so that she is now the senior most woman in the 112th Congress. She serves on the very important House Appropriations Committee and also on the House Defense Subcommittee. We are so happy to have you here today. Um, I, I believe this is your first visit to our law school. Is that, is that correct? To the law school. To the law school. <laughs> and, and we hope um, that we'll be honored with your presentations in future conferences as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Am I allowed to turn this down, or does that do something? Is that all right? I don't want to shut off anything here. What a pleasure and honor, truly. Did something happen? Oh, that's so you can see me. Uh, what a pleasure and a great honor and privilege it is for me to be here today with you. I um, looked forward to this session with great anticipation. And um, I know that my dear colleague, Congressman Dennis Kucinich, was here earlier this morning. Uh, he and I work very closely together. For those of you who aren't from Ohio, uh, both Congressman Kucinich and I represent parts of northern Ohio. Our district goes almost from the western border of Ohio along the southern rim of Lake Erie until it almost meets Cleveland. And then Congressman Kucinich and other members take over. So we are from the part of Ohio that I like to think is the progressive part of Ohio. <laughs> and uh, in fact, in the district that I represent uh, is a college called Oberlin College, which was the first, the first in the United States to admit women and minorities. So we like to think of ourselves as a place that sees the future. And um, my first degree was taken from the University of Wisconsin, where I was a major in history and never taught any of this, even though, I'm a second generation American, by the way, uh, even though I specialized uh, in uh, world history and the history of World War II. So it's very interesting to go back and read the texts that we were taught and to see that this had no place in it. Mr. Adamczyk, you did not have a place in the texts that I was um, studying from as a student here in the United States long after World War II uh, had ended. But the motto of the University of Wisconsin contains these words, the continual sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. And I have viewed my own life as a truth seeker for a very long time. John also tells us, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And I think that is why we are here today. We are in the great tradition of both the United States and our Constitution and the tradition of Poland's first Constitution. But I can guarantee you that most Americans do not know the nexus between those two Constitutions and how what happened in our country carried the flame of liberty forward when in fact what happened in Poland was exactly the reverse in terms of what happened at the political level, though the flame of that liberty was carried by her people even until today. So we really are very, history has been waiting for us and waiting for us to be here today at Case Western Reserve and this great, great law school. Um, Maria, I want to thank you very much for the work uh, that you have done with the Cressy Siberia Foundation, which is extraordinarily important. In the district that I represent, we have individuals who should tell their story and still have not in the work of that particular foundation. I also consider everyone here today to be very noble and to be a part of a very worthy effort to make history right. Mr. Adamczyk, you honor us by your presence and by your courage and by your carrying the flame of liberty forward so that the world shall know the truth. You are a very strong, you, you're a very strong and a very honest man. All of us can be enlightened by you. 
I think that for those of you who aren't of Polish heritage, but also love liberty, um, I like to say that the Poles love it more. And if you're lucky to have a piece of that heritage in you, you know how to persevere. It is not therefore surprising that in the Congress of the United States today, three of the four most senior members in the House and Senate are all of Polish American heritage. In the House where I serve, it was mentioned that I'm now the senior Democratic woman in the U.S. House, but Congressman John Dingell of Michigan, also of Polish heritage, is the senior male member. And in the Senate of the United States, Senator Barbara Mikulski is the senior woman. We only lack the man <laughs> over there in the Senate. But it's very interesting because I think that that quality of perseverance comes from great hardship. And Poles know how to persevere. And Polish Americans have the duality that they live with, where perseverance and the love of liberty are first. Um, I happen to be the author of the legislation that took us almost two decades to build the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. That's a story unto itself, but it is an incomplete story. And I will tell you, when we first began drafting that legislation back in the 1980s, <clears throat> we had hoped that a part of that legislation would include a museum. Because I'd seen a museum in Caen, France, during my travels, and I said, uh, that Museum of Peace is something that should be replicated in the United States. <clears throat> and as I traveled Europe, I was told by others, oh, the Americans will never do that. And I said, well, maybe we can prove you wrong. They said, no, no. Americans are just into science and technology. They're afraid of history. Interesting, from the European point of view, how they would view the American character. I didn't quite agree with that, but the museum did not survive the bill. Uh, we wanted to actually build it in a uh, section under the memorial, if any of you visited the memorial, that could be a room like this. Uh, and uh, we would have artifacts, we would have um, a way of people coming a hundred years from now and understanding that the greatest legacy of the 20th century was the victory for our country of liberty over tyranny. We still haven't adequately represented that. Uh, but we're talking with people and foundations that have been set up. And we do have a veterans history project that is part of the Library of Congress where we're trying to <coughs> assemble personal stories. Maybe some of you and your families have contributed to that. Uh, we now have over, oh, I think it's close to 200,000 American stories that are a part of that. But what I learned from that uh, project <clears throat> was that some of the bravest Americans I knew could not have their stories placed in the archives because they were not born in the United States. One of my dearest friends, whose pin I wear today, who was a soldier in the Polish cavalry and served two years, was actually at Mokra when the uh, Nazi tanks came over the border uh, on, in September of um, 1939, September 1st, 1939, um, and lost 75% of the soldiers in that unit, and then went to fight on the other side of Poland three weeks later when the Communists and Red Army invaded from the east, and then served in the underground for two years until a mistake was made by one of his colleagues who ultimately was beheaded. And he was revealed and was then placed at Auschwitz and um, Gross Rosen and Leitmeritz. Even though he'd been an American citizen and his daughter had been the valedictorian of our class at St. Ursula Academy in Toledo, Ohio, and had raised his family with his wife who'd been tortured at Ravensbrück, their story could not be told because they were not born in the United States, they were naturalized citizens. And I came to fully realize as a member of Congress, oh my God, how incomplete our history really is. And what can I do as a, as a citizen of our country to help to make American history complete and the history of freedom and the fight for freedom complete? And I realized, as many of you do, what great effort that still takes.
and that's part of why we are here today. I've asked myself many times, why has it taken 70 years? I listened to the excellent professors and the ambassador who's kindly joined us today. Why has it taken 70 years? I'll tell you an experience I had two years ago that was a shock to me. Prior to my going to Poland, um, not paid for by the government, but by myself, uh, two years ago for that 70th anniversary commemoration, uh, we wrote the President of the United States a letter. <clears throat> and um, I am a member of the Polish caucus inside the Congress of the United States. And we asked that Americans of very high ranking join us at Gdańsk uh, for the official global commemoration that occurred during the month of September. And we asked perhaps someone from the executive branch to join us. And um, we never got an answer. But as we arrived at Gdańsk, and I traveled with the US Ambassador Victor Ash from um, uh, Tennessee, who was our ambassador at that point, um, he said, Marcy, who's going to represent our government? I said, sir, I don't know yet, because we haven't gotten an answer. You know, they always say security. That's always the reason we can't tell you because of security. <clears throat> we ended up, uh, the United States, even though um, we had the uh, Angela Merkel of Germany and Nicolas Sarkozy of France and uh, Vladimir Putin came from Russia, uh, I ended up being the highest ranking uh, official from the United States of America and I actually do believe the House is the highest ranking uh, as I look at the ebb and flow of American history. But uh, I truly expected someone of the level of Secretary of State from our country, and they weren't there. So uh, General Jones, who headed our National Security Council, uh, was the individual who represented the United States. But I thought the vacuum continues. I mean, that's how I really read it as not so much as a member of Congress, but as an American citizen. This tells us how difficult it is to make history complete and to continually sift and winnow until one can get to the truth and liberty can be seen uh, in its fullest form and the sacrifice that has gone to make the very idea of liberty continue to live as a concept in the world. Um, one of the uh, efforts that we are making in our own region, uh, and this is something our family is doing, working with our local history room at our local public library, is trying to create a shelf called At Freedom's Edge uh, to try to identify individuals, whether they be Polish American, whether they be African American, Chinese American, the horrible, horrible sacrifices that these Americans who have a duality they are Americans plus. They have a Chinese heritage, they have a Polish heritage, they have a Hungarian heritage, whatever that might be, that their stories not be lost to history. And we are helping to write these stories, to record these stories, and perhaps in the various places from which you come, you might consider dovetailing with Libra Foundation, the Cressy Siberia Foundation, or organizations in your own area. Because I really believe as a member of the House, it takes a long time to do anything of significance. But if we are to be a democratic country, and that's with a small d, that means the people have to be empowered themselves to take their history forward. And we have to find ways and means to do that locally. One of the best examples I know here in Cleveland is with the Ukrainian-American community, where the Fedinsky family and the home that they lived in has become a museum, and behind it now in archives. And I've been able to help them a little bit, but the tithing that has gone on in that community has created an extraordinary resource here in Cleveland, the likes of which every ethnic group in America should copy. And my hope is that the archival collections that are being housed there will eventually be able to be virtually restored to Ukraine. And the same could happen with Poland, and the same could happen with nations of Africa, and the same could happen with China someday. And we think about what we can do as individuals. 
change is possible through us. Now I know that it's time for lunch and you're probably all hungry out there. Uh, but I have some thoughts about what one might do uh, to carry forward the learnings from this conference. First of all, you need a task force. You know that. If you're going to carry knowledge forward, no one does it alone. So there has to be some sort of umbrella effort that is organized. In the Congress, we divide ourselves up among committees, but we also have organizations that we self-identify with. For example, I'm a member of the Polish Caucus. I can tell you Polonia in America hardly comes to us with an idea. The uh, major idea that has been promoted by the organizations of late has been the Polish visa waiver issue. That is an important issue, but it is not the only issue. And it is not the issue that is most important to most Americans of Polish heritage. It is a subset of something larger. And so my challenge to you is to think about how to create another issue that you could bring to an organization like the Polish Caucus, which in the House is headed by Congressman Dan Lipinski of Chicago. Mr. Adamczyk, you're from, are you from Chicago? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, there are both Republican and Democratic members of this organization. Congressman Kucinich heads the Russian Caucus on his side of the aisle. I co-chair the Ukrainian Caucus. People say, Marcy, why do you co-chair the Ukrainian Caucus? You're of Polish heritage. I said, because it's the next rung in. And uh, so we, we, have to, we have to see our way forward. So I think that if an effort, whether it would be something through the Endowment for the Humanities, where we would try to restore archival records in some way, whether it would be an amendment to the Veterans History Project to make it more complete. Really, we need to talk about that. We have plenty of smart attorneys in the room here who can help us figure out. I'm not an attorney, by the way. Sometimes that gets in the way of creativity. Uh, sorry, say that in a law school. Uh, but I've been in Congress now 29 years. Uh, so, um, but, but I do think that um, there are means to get into the Congress um, in terms of, of a proposal. And there are agencies uh, and programs, even the library services program at the federal level, which could be very important if several organizations would network and would come together with a proposal. Um, the, uh, uh, the last point that I really want to make uh, before lunch is that um, uh, this is a very important conference to me personally, and I feel very deeply the incompleteness of history. And if any, I think to myself, if any nation can do this, surely America, the United States, is the place that can help to push knowledge forward. That is our responsibility as a free people. But as I look at those who may be here from Poland and are of Polish heritage, uh, certainly a nation that cracked the enigma during World War II, certainly a nation that produced Marie Curie, certainly a nation that wrote the most democratic constitution in Europe in 1791. Certainly that nation can also meet the challenge of a new era and make history complete. Thank you so very much. It's been a privilege to be here.